to and I really want to support people who are doing a good job but also if we can find something to really shout about Bulgaria something that Bulgaria is world, world leading um, I think it's a really good thing to do so anyway let me just show you a few um, slides just a reminder for people that aren't Bulgarian about where, where Bulgaria is with the Black Sea to the east um, Romania to the north Serbia and North Macedonia, as we should now call it, um, to the west, and then Greece and some of Turkey to the south. So mostly landlocked, and the climate obviously varies from quite continental to um, having some maritime influence. Well, we're not really here to talk about the, the total background of Bulgaria, but just wanted to give those of you that need it a little bit of perspective. So kind of historically, Bulgaria was divided into five wine regions. Legally now it's divided into two, so for PGI purposes. So this green area and the northern half of this sort of fawn colored area is the whole of the Danubian plain. But as you can imagine, the climate in the north west corner compared to the Black Sea coast corner is, is different. And then in the south, the whole of the south is the Thracian lowlands. But the Struma Valley over here, which opens to Greece and the Mediterranean, is, is very warm. Um, and then obviously in the east, you've got the Black Sea influence to moderate the climate. So probably we're going to see Bulgaria divided up into more regions again. Um, so this is the map that the National Vine and Wine Chamber sent me when I was writing my book. Uh, this is not codified in law yet, but we, we will wait and see what happens. So next up, a few background statistics. So just over 64,000 hectares of vineyards officially, uh, but in reality, approximately 30,000 hectares that are being harvested for wine. Um, more red grapes planted than white, but actually the harvest is about 50-50 because the white grapes are more productive than the red ones. Um, and just over a million hectolitres of wine in 2018. They're quite and a little, little bit under in 2019. 2020 data, not out yet. Um, and just under 300 registered wineries in the country. Um, which, you know, is, it goes up every year, to be honest. Last, I think I had two, 260 when I wrote my book. Um, so this is some of the data that uh, particularly Desi dug out for me. So the 47% active winemakers in, in Bulgarian wine cellars, then the members of the Union of Enologists, the actual, those are actual numbers uh, of, you know, 85, Enologists that are female and 81 male in, in the union of enologists. So that's that's quite significant. And then I think it's quite interesting that the you know 50 student numbers at the University of, of Food Technology at Plovdiv, where which is the, the center of winemaking studies in, in Bulgaria, have been 50-50, but actually 60%. Um, of graduates started in the wine industry, women started in the wine industry, not all becoming winemakers, some working in labs and bottling facilities and so on. Um, and also if you go, um, the data at the bottom of the screen from 1994 to 2000, that came from Katia Gargova um, from her era, and that was 140 women and 110 men graduated in wine. So obviously women of all, long been quite significant to, in terms of studying wine and moving into the wine world. And I thought, again, I would do a little bit of research to see if I could find any background information. And, you know, California came to mind because, you know, the general perception is that California is a very right on, very socially aware, very uh, equality aware place. And there was some Santa Clara University research, which was done in November 2020, and that showed that 14% of California's 4,200 wineries have women winemakers. Um, and then I looked at Romania, um, again, because I thought Romania was also another country that went through communism, obviously a different communist regime. Um, it's a much bigger 
wine industry in Romania, you know, 102,000 hectares. So it's three times Romania, and, uh, Bulgaria and some. I don't actually know how many wineries there are and nobody seems to have this information at the moment, but all we could come up with um, talking to a group of active Romanian wine people with 16 women winemakers uh, and three of whom actually own the winery. So, you know, that shows Bulgaria in kind of a very different um, sharp contrast, I think. And then another 23 women owning or co-owning wineries. And it happened in this conversation that somebody said something that really hit home. You know, you can see the quote before someone who was interested in working in wine and had people say it, telling her that it wasn't for women, it's heavy, it's cold, you know, focus on your family. And you think, you know, in this day and age, nobody should have to face that kind of comment. Um, you know, and there was another example today, somebody sharing a promotional video about, about Bulgaria, and it's all pretty women and dancers. And I think, you know, we've moved beyond that, haven't we? but clearly we haven't. So it's still worth the fight, I think. Um, so I talked to quite a few of my friends in Bulgaria, particularly my female friends, um, because they've, they've lived it, to come up with some ideas and, and theories about um, what might be going on, what's, what's behind all this, and whether it's a uniquely Bulgarian situation or whether it's something that we could... Um, learn from and take lessons to, uh, you know, take lessons wider to other countries. Um, so definitely communism came up in a lot of conversations, um, particularly, you know, and this came up with sort of some of the older women friends of mine who lived through it and some of my slightly younger ones who grew up through it. So there was definitely, you know, it seemed to be part of propaganda that everybody worked and not working was actually, you know, not the done thing. It was bourgeois. It was far too much. You know, it just wasn't the done thing. So everybody was expected to work and to work full time. Everybody was expected to be educated to university level. So there was a lot of emancipation through this free education through the 60s and 70s. Um, but certainly a couple of people reported to me that they felt that certainly in the 80s to the 1990s, um, women tended to work in the shadows. So they were doing the labs, they were in the QC department, they were managing the bottling lines. And certainly I would say my early trips back in the, you know, around the, uh, you know, 89, 90, 91, um, you tended to see the women managing the bottling line or in the lab and you didn't see them. They weren't the chief winemaker showing you around the winery uh, on the whole. But then what happened after that was, you know, small wineries started to, to appear. And this is me kind of slightly putting two and two together, but certainly women moved out of the lab uh, from the mid 1990s onwards and possible and they started to take on winemaker positions um, and I suspect that some of this ability to multitask how to understand the details to you know if you understand how the lab works and the quality control works and you know how to make wine then if you if it's a small winery and you're only going to have one or two winemakers actually that ability to do everything is very useful and possibly again this is slightly you know, uh, and I'd be interested to hear people's um, feedback and experience on this. Possibly that, um, you know, some of the ma male winemakers who were head of a team weren't doing that detail. They had people to do the detail for them, if you see what I mean. Um, so again, you know, it'll be interesting to hear from other people who've lived through it, whether I'm picking up the right, the right story here. Um, and then it seems to be this case as well, you know, women were saying to me that actually in all industries, we see, they're seeing women um, across, you know, in publishing, in sales, um, 
you know, significant presence and there's an expectation that people will work and people will be respected for their abilities and have a career and there'll be no, you know, um, and I think it's easier for young women coming in and seeing that these are valid careers and that winemaking is a valid career if you're not fighting the tide of opinion all the time. If you're not having to be better than better than the best to fight your corner as a, as a lone woman in an industry. So, so I think that's a factor as well, this expectation of equality that's been set up in the past, but that, that has continued and long may it continue, I think. Um, I think I mentioned the university students being 50-50, which is which is great. I mean, you know, it wasn't that long ago. Again, when I was studying, there were six men to every woman in my college. So, um, and that's changed a lot in the last few years. Um, and also, and again, a couple of people mentioned this in discussion, um, that things like smoking, um, women's, you know, known better, more sensitive, a sense of smell and taste mentioned by a number of people. I've long had a pet theory that smoking and the ban on smoking has actually been quite important in evolution of winemaking styles in Bulgaria. I think there's, it's not the only one, but, you know, I remember the early days uh, before the smoking ban, you know, I would go to wine events where people are tasting wine and somebody in front of you would light up and it would be a, a puff on a cigarette, mouthful of food, puff on a cigarette, glass of mouthful of wine. And it was absolutely impossible to taste anything subtle and elegant in that environment. So, um, and this, this tradition as well of starting a meal with a glass of rakia and salad, it's really hard for light, elegant wines to follow after. So for those of you that don't know, rakia is like grappa. So it's distilled um, particularly from the skins and the tank bottoms and the lees and so on. So it can be a little rough around the edges and it's certainly pretty strong stuff. So if you then go from a glass of rakia at 40 odd percent to, to try and to have something light and elegant and refreshing, um, it's kind of quite difficult. Um, but the last, I don't know, three to five years, I would say that from my personal point of view, I have found the wine scene in Bulgaria to have become very dynamic. Um, there's so much going on um, in terms of experimenting with new grapes, new wine styles, pet nap, orange, natural winemaking, amphoras, clay, you know, you name it. Um, and I also think it's moved on from, you know, the first few years of the new era when everybody was trying to show that they made something different to the communist era when it was about volume. Um, the first few years of the new era were all about power for a lot of wines, lots of concentration, lots of intensity and lots of oak as well. And I think now winemakers have had more confidence to build, you know, they know that they've they're understanding their vineyards. They know they can grow good quality fruit. So actually you can rein back on the winemaking and actually let some of the elegance in the finesse show through as well. And I'm sure that, you know, this is not to say that there aren't some great male winemakers in Bulgaria as well, but the scene of young enthusiastic winemakers, be they men or women, um, has had a lot to do with that dynamism. Um, so I think it's not all glory. I think there's still some barriers. It seems several people were reporting that they feel that childcare tends to be the woman's burden. Um, and that in the previous era, actually, they were pretty much brought up by the state in state kindergartens because women worked full time. Um, other women have reported that they've had very supportive husbands and partners who've taken on a lot of the domestic duties and enabled them to fly in their careers. So lots of personal stories and differences there. Um, I think at the winery ownership level, there are fewer women. That is my impression anyway. And certainly where some of the new investments have come with 
money from outside the industry from other businesses and that money is not necessarily belonging to women according to one source um, but you know if they're coming into wine with with money then the young winemakers need to you know encourage them to spend that on allowing them to travel and to study abroad and to learn you know from the global picture um, I think equality of pay was only mentioned a little bit, not always there, but it seems to be less of a concern than other countries. And I was quite surprised that there actually aren't any organisations supporting women in wine as yet, but several people mentioned it as an aspiration and something that they're working on. So I think that could be an interesting point for um, discussion later. And then in general, I think that Bulgarian wine needs to, as an industry, you know, there's a lot of young faces, both on the consumer side and the winemaking side, but it still needs to be an aspiration and a rewarding career choice. Otherwise, we'll lose some of the best and brightest to that to that industry, uh, which would be a shame. Um, so I wanted to talk to you about then some some wines. Um, I don't have a chat window if anybody had any questions at all. Um, I don't know where my chat window has disappeared to. Can you help with that, Stoyan? <laughs> if not... Uh... No questions at the moment, Caroline. Okay. Um, so the idea of the session then was to show um, a few wines where there are women owners and or women winemakers or influential women. I think all four of them have women winemakers. The, there were so many I could have chosen. Um, but tonight, for those of you that chose, um, joined in with the tasting, you know, I picked four that I thought show some really exciting wines and to show some of the dynamism of the Bulgarian wine scene and uh, the people involved. So, um, so the first wine from Chateau Copsa, let me just stop the share for a second and see if I can show you the bottle. Okay, so for those of you that have got it, we're going to start with um, Axel Rose Valley Misket from Chateau Copsa. So let me go back to my share screen. Get it up. Yep. Okay, so this is the winery, and uh, Petia Minkova, who's the, the owner, is here uh, in the photo. And I believe she's here as well. If anybody's got any questions for her and the a um, couple more pictures. So this is inside the winery, you know, typically modern Bulgarian wines, you expect to see the kind of equipment that you'd see, see everywhere. And it's in the heart of the Rose Valley, which is an important sub-region in, in Bulgaria. These are the Balkan mountains ahead. And, you know, it's a fantastic place to, to visit, um, particularly at the around the time of the rose harvest, because the whole valley is, is a glorious, uh, vivid colour and the air is scented with all these beautiful roses. So um, Bulgaria produces something like 85% of the world's rose oil. Um, and I do wonder a little bit whether, a um, bit like, you know, the eucalyptus in um, Australia, you pick up some of those essential oils from the roses in the wine, but certainly there's a little fragrance here. Or what is often, so red misket is the great variety here, which is, seems to be a truly ancient um, Bulgarian grape. There is a little bit of relation, um, a relationship's been discovered with a very rare old Hungarian grape, but as far as anybody knows, basically it's an authentic, historic, been around for a long time in Bulgaria grape. And it's called red misket because it has slightly pink colored skins, but it's pretty much, it's, it's always vinified as a white wine as far as I've, I've ever come across. And it's always been treated a, for a long time as a bit of a workhorse grape. It's a little bit on the neutral side unless you treat it with extra care. So the secret here is, is several fold. I mean, it's, it's old vines and very careful, low yields, careful canopy management. Um, this is the winemaker, Madalena. Um, and just, 
you know, it's, it's a grape that's a bit prone to oxidation. So you've got to handle it super carefully. Um, but, you know, I think the result here is that you've got this pretty gently scented, very attractive. So I don't know whether it's suggestibility of where it comes from, but there is a floral character to it. And it's a grape that's prone to having quite low acidity, but here they've managed to achieve, you know, real fresh vibrancy about it. So, um, Petia or Madalena, this is your opportunity if either of you would like to comment on the wine, um, women in wine in Bulgaria, whether I've said anything really stupid so far. <laughs> uh, nothing. Good evening, everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, thank uh, to Caroline and to the old tower guys for the great uh, idea to gather all of us during these difficult times and to discuss wine all together. And I'm especially proud that the issue today and the topic is Bulgarian wine and mostly female in Bulgarian wine. There are not few, as you saw already, and as Caroline said, we are quite a powerful lobby here in Bulgaria. Women, women who are working and uh, involved on a daily basis in our wineries, in our business, in our trade, in, in general in the idea of good, high quality Bulgarian wines. Uh, what can I say? Red, red Miscet is, the, is our fame, and that's the grape we are proud of. You can find this great variety, especially in the Rose Valley. And I'm extremely proud that we are exactly in the heart of the Rose Valley because that's another uh, strong point of our winery being the only one winery in the Rose Valley, in the heart of the Rose Valley, I mean Karovo, because it's quite a long uh, territory, uh, the Rose Valley, but the heart is exactly Karovo and where is Chateau Kopsa. And uh, really the red misket finds its best condition under the Balkan. Uh, our vineyards are located uh, exactly on the footsteps of the Balkan mountain, between the two mountains, Sredna Gora and Balkan. And both of them works like a sh sh shutter, shutter to our vineyards. So they're well protected, but at the same time we have all uh, during all the year, uh, a slight wind that helps to, to, to have very uh, mineral grape and uh, to, to have less uh, disease on our vineyards. So I think the conditions are really amazing, especially for white grapes, which are really quite difficult to grow in Bulgaria, the white grapes due to the hot weather in general. And, um, not every winery in Bulgaria is producing great and good quality white wines, and we are proud of them. Special thanks to Madeleine and her husband, Angel, who are involved from the very first day of the beginning of our, of our winery in Shatakovsa. Mm, okay, thank you very much. And a story I, I think quite a lot of you have told me is that you remember grandparents and, and grandmothers as well as grandfathers being mentioned in wine. So it does seem to be something that, you know, that that previous era where everybody was involved in wine is sort of seeped into people's DNA and, and awareness. So, um, but yeah. Um, yeah, so yes. And I think your point actually about uh, white wines in Bulgaria is is a good one, because generally I feel that, you know, red wines have tended to lead the way in Bulgaria. They've tended to be the ones that have been admired. The white grapes that are grown are either international ones that are, you know, copies of the of the international models. Chardonnay actually does really well. Viognier does make some nice wines. Vermentino also, but of course they're always going to be compared to the originals. Whereas if we can develop and add value and interest to Bulgaria's unique white grape varieties, then that's a kind of unique calling card for Bulgaria. So for me, it's really good to see these local white grape varieties actually getting more attention as well. And that's I think also a, um, a developing area in Bulgaria. So um, 
and so well done both of you to Petier and to Madeleine and to Madeleine. Bobby. Um, Madeleine. <laughs> Madeleine's husband as well who she works with and and they cooperate together and she tells me they both have different strengths but they work well together as a team and she also thinks that Bulgarian winemakers are actually really supportive of each other and talk to each other when they come across problems and and so on and so on which is also really encouraging to hear so uh Thank you very much for sharing. Only before we move on to the next wine, I guess, Caroline, a couple of quick questions on the present one. Uh, yeah. One of them is, is this Karlovsky Miskett? Uh, as, as we know, there are a few clones of uh, Miskett. As well as the next question is, how much of this grape is planted, which probably Petya may help with. Uh, actually, yeah, red Miskett is Karlovsky Miskett during the, you know, the socialist time when Bulgaria and Rose Valley was one of the biggest exporter of white wines made from uh, red misket. They didn't call it red misket, they call it Karlovsky misket because the biggest winery in this, for, for this kind of grape and wine in the socialist time was based in Karlovo and Banya, this big vineyard, Vimprom, you know, Vimprom Rosova Dolena. So that's why they call it Karlovsky misket, but that's the same grape. A red misket might be, be a kind of misunderstanding about the white or red, or red wine. That's why it's more clear for the public to say just Karlovsky misket, not to have confusion with the red. Uh, in our winery, we have in total 60 hectares of grapes, of vineyards. Most of them are whites and the bigger part is misket. Uh, Unfortunately, last year we went through uprooting about uh, 20 hectares of our red misket in order to make a, a conversion. I mean, to make again the red misket, but in a, how to say, in a, a uh, wow, well, uh, smaller rows, you know, this uh, European program that um, allow you to plant more vines in a smaller, place. Okay, so so looking, in the next three years, we will have again more grape. But uh, yes, most of our vineyards are misket. Okay, and Rose, while we're just talking about that, unfortunately, data for what's planted in Bulgaria and what's actually harvested commercially are impossible. Can't get them from anybody. There's some 2013 data that's been supplied to the EU that covers 60 odd thousand hectares. But as you've seen from my stats earlier, only 30,000 hectares are harvested. So nobody actually knows what the real picture is for what's grown for winemaking um, and what's just been abandoned. So can't really answer the, the total question, but only, you know, individual wineries like Petia at Copsa can tell you what they grow themselves. Caroline, only quickly, as there are two more mm. very quick questions on that. Mm. Uh, one of them I'll answer, which is what is the retail price of the wine? It is at 11.85 on our online store. And the next question, which probably Petya may answer best, is uh, what sort of soils are in uh, Rose Valley? Hmm. The soils are really very specific uh, for our place. Uh, they are uh, sandy stones. Sandy, sandy soil with uh, small stones on the surface, uh, which is really quite good for the white grape varieties. Of course, we have this, this is a disadvantage for the reds in a in certain extent, but for the white grapes, it's really very good soil because it's very alluvial, very, uh, you have a lot of stones, uh, a lot of slate, even our Sauvignon Buon, which is on 700 met meters above the sea level, maybe one of the highest vineyard in Bulgaria, is only uh, slate and stones, which makes, makes and gives really amazing minerality in our white grapes. Okay, awesome, thank you. So um, I think we've had a good, good start there. So I'll take you now on to... Um, Another winery down in South Sakar, so Bratanov, um, and I should try and show the, those of you that can see my picture, Tamyanica. So lots of people like to claim that Tamyanica is an indigenous uh, Bulgarian grape variety, and it kind of isn't and it kind of is, okay, so 
genetic analysis shows that it is muscat apatigram, but the muscat family has been known all across Central and Eastern Europe, probably since the ancient Greeks brought it in about 800 BC. So each of these countries kind of has its own selection of muscat. Um, so I say kind of local, but also not local. So again, another relatively small winery, but with some very significant wine people in it. So Tanya on the left, um, her husband Christo in the middle and Maria Stoyeva, the winemaker on the right. Um, I say they're in South Sakar. So right down towards the Greek border in the south of the country where it's relatively warm, but Tamianica actually seems to go do really well there. Um, so, but you also have a little bit of influence from the GNC and so on and so on to help take the edge off the climate. Um, and so Maria as a winemaker, her sort of inspiration came from loving France and French culture. Her parents were musicians, opera musicians. So um, she actually went and studied in Dijon. Um, Tanya started discovering wine as a student, got interested in wine, started buying wine magazines, reading about wine, dreaming, but not admitting to anybody that really wine would be something she'd be interested in. And then happened to fall in love with Christo here. Um, and Christo's father and his brother, the three of them, um, decided to go back and recover their family, you know, the one hectare that their, their, grand, their father and grandfather had owned and gradually build up now to 24 hectares. Now, Tanya tells me the story that, um, so they started in 2010 and she tells me the story that they actually had um, a woman from New Zealand as an intern winemaker. Uh, the first time they made the Tamianica actually, and it was then that she and Haristo started to, to talk about really thinking that perhaps actually a, a woman a winemaker would be kind of a good fit for what they wanted to achieve with South Sakar and interpreting this really special place. It's like the, you know, maybe the Cote d'Or of, of, of Bulgaria, you know, there's so many good producers in this area. So a lot of exciting wines being made here. Um, and then she happened to meet Maria, who'd just come back from Dijon, just qualified. And, you know, so it was a great fit for the team to, to come together. Um, and so just show you. And also, so we've got Tanya again, Maria in the middle, and Katia Gargova that several people talk, mentioned as an inspiration. So from the Katia uh, qualified in 1994. So she was... Uh, you know, a generation earlier, perhaps in the, the winemaking scene than some of the young faces that, that I'm, I'm talking to you about. But anyway, so one of the things Bratanov has been very um, keen on developing is the concept of very low intervention winemaking and wild fermentations as well. So this is, this is wild fermented um, Tamianica from a single vineyard selection. Uh, and I'll just show you. So this is the vineyard with the gently rolling hills heading up, um, into the distance. And on the right, this little picture is a bird's nest in, in amongst some Tamianica berries there. So again, showing you about, you know, the low intervention, you know, it's relatively, it's a relatively healthy, um, you know, the rolling hills, nice breezes and so on. So relatively low disease pressure. Um, you know, but it's important to show, you know, because vineyards can be a little bit stark. So it's nice to see wildlife growing in the vineyards. So, um, um, yes, yeah, so Tanya or um, Maria, would you like to say a few words about your wine if you're here? Good evening, everyone. Nice to meet so many people from around the world mm -hmm. and uh, talk about um, some very exciting Bulgarian wines. Um, by the way, uh, some of my favorite white wines from Bulgaria come from Shatakopsa. I, I believe that it's truly a very wonderful terror for, 
for the white for white grapes and some very elegant red ones also. Uh, so we are a family winery and um, already 44 hectares. <laughs> so we grew up a little bit <laughs> EU programs, you know. <laughs> uh, but still, the new vineyards are going to to give some more fruit in the future so with some more varieties we planted there. Um, Tamianka, that's how we pronounce it in Bulgaria, uh, Tamianka, uh, is uh, a choice uh, my father-in-law, Stoicho Bratanov, made in uh, 2006 uh, when he had to decide what kind of uh, varieties uh, he would plant on the, on the new vineyard. And it was um, like a risky decision because at that time Tamianka was known mostly among older people and uh, it was related to very cheap um, big volume wines exported to the um, Soviet Union mainly uh, and in most cases uh, off dry style and uh, you never know at that time what uh, kind of variety exactly goes to the, into the bottle <laughs> by the way. So it was a big risk to uh, launch uh, to the market a uh, very modern style of Tamianka. Um, uh, half of the people uh, knew the variety as old version uh, and um, old face, and the other half, the younger people, they just didn't uh, hear about, haven't heard about this uh, variety at all. So we decided to, to choose this very modern bottle, the Riesling bottle, uh, the elegant modern label, and uh, uh, absolutely okay. different approach to the winemaking. I'll just stop my screen share so you can see the bottle. Um, everybody? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it's, by the way, the, the label was, has, hasn't been changed for uh, since the 2013 vintage. And 2019, we made a little change. It's now called Tamianka Shishmanovo Vineyards. Shishmanovo is the name of the village where our vineyards in Sakar Mountain are situated. Because since the new vineyards started giving grapes, uh, we already have around 20% of grapes from uh, the other plot. It's not already um, a single vineyard, Tamianka. And, uh, it's, uh, and, and we are fair, uh, absolutely fair with that. That's why we, we, we changed the name to Shishmanovo Vineyards and put a mandala uh, above the plot. Um, so uh, the most important thing is that we made a big change in our um, winemaking policy in, uh, since Maria uh, has joined our, joined our team in 2015. Uh, so we decided to go, as you, uh, Caroline said, uh, to more low interventional style of winemaking and, in, and vineyard growing both. That's a process both in the vineyards and in, in the winery, of course. And since 2016, all of our wines, no matter if they are going to the bottle or sell, uh, being sold in bulk in back in box, uh, are well fermented with the natural microflora coming from the vineyards. And apart from that, uh, the, the intervention in like using analogical products is very low, um, as low as possible. And um, we, we, we are really uh, happy to see that we're going to the right direction with this approach in winemaking. But Maria can talk more about that. Yeah, okay, great, thank you. Um, a, quick, a quick question, uh, maybe Tanya, what is the aging potential? I mean, we had uh, such a question in the chat, mm -hmm. I believe regarding mm -hmm. the previous wine, but we can maybe touch on that. What would be the aging potential of that, uh, Tamianka, only quickly? Uh, being an aromatic variety, it's, it, it doesn't have a very long aging potential if you compare it to like a Chardonnay from Chablis, but uh, of, at least four or five years is the wine is really nice. Uh, we recently opened a bottle from the first vintage, 2013. It had a completely different character, more uh, um, 
uh, more like a Riesling, uh, uh, each Riesling than a Tomyanka, so it lost its typical floral uh, expression. Uh, but uh, on the other side, it was quite nice for drinking. So depending on the year, the style, um, the acidity uh, is very important in, in this kind of wines. But at least three, four years, I believe, even five, the wine could be good. okay. Actually, the question was for Miss Ket, not for mm -hmm. uh, Timianica. Thank you, anyway. Uh, okay, awesome. Shall we, obviously, conscious of time. Did you want to add anything, Maria, or should we save that till the end if there are any more comments you want to make? Okay, in that case, we'll switch on to a couple of reds. And I want to introduce you to my friend, Adriana who I've known for a very long time. And actually she was um, a great inspiration to me in, because I had a gap. So I was buying Bulgarian wine in the early 1990s. And then I moved away from wine buying and, and so on and kind of forgot Eastern Europe for a few years and came back in 2003. And Adriana was kind of one of the people that made a huge impression on me at that point. Um, and you know, I've followed her career and her partner, this very sadly much missed dear friend of mine, Ogi Svetanov, who sadly is no longer with us and was Adriana's partner in wine. But she is continuing both her vision and uh, his legacy at Borovitsa Winery. So just show you a couple of pictures of what the scenery is like around this, this corner of Bulgaria. Um, this amazing, amazing old Devonian sandstone that's been wind blown into these amazing shapes and these huge rocks that uh, this was going to be their, a vineyard of theirs just, just behind these rocks where she's standing. Um, that I believe I bought a few vines of Cabernet Franc to go into that vineyard a long time ago. And then um, the vineyards literally at the foot of the rocks on this degraded old old sandstone in a corner of Bulgaria that nobody actually thought was only good for winemaking and particularly not for red wines so it's right in the far northwest corner close to the Danube where um, you have long sunshine hours but it's a lot it's cooler than the, the rest of Bulgaria and Adriana and Oggy had a had a vision that they wanted to produce very handcrafted, very individual wines from little plots of old vines wherever they could find them, um, not necessarily owning the vineyards, but working with growers and so on. And the first time they took me to see this rundown winery that they bought, they didn't tell me. We went at night, left me in this hotel, we had a lovely dinner, went to bed opened the curtains in the morning and it was this gobsmacking view over these amazing rocks. So I would definitely recommend visiting this part of the world. And so Adriana is also, I think, quite a, a very significant figure as a, as a woman in the wine industry because she was really the first person that made, saw the opportunity to make premium wines in Bulgaria. Um, so, you know, she was influenced by E and E black pepper Shiraz that, um, right, I want to make wine like this in Bulgaria. Mm -hmm. So, and that was the launch of Maxima Reserve, which she still makes Maxima. Um, so she was kind of the first icon wine in Bulgaria, which kind of started to set the scene for other people to then think, hang on, we can do more than just Cabernet for supermarkets and, and stuff in Bulgaria. So I think she's a very significant person in, in those terms, as well as a, a dear friend of mine. <laughs> um, so she graduated in 1979 from uh, the University in Plovdiv. I'll just show you this picture quickly, because I love this picture, because it shows the difference between the old approach. This is, you know, a lorry for grapes for a big winery at the back, and Adriana buying grapes in small crates, um, you know, and I think the contrast between the old way of doing things and the new way of doing things. And then also the plastic bags are another story that I could tell you, but um, not really relevant to this wine. They had a Gamza called Black Pack. Um, anyway, so this is Gamza, which apparently is an Arab Arabic word meaning capricious. 
um, because it's quite difficult to grow. It's quite pale colored. It's quite, um, so generally it makes quite light reds. It's a little bit disease prone as well. Um, and it kind of fell out of favor a lot in both in other countries that grow it as well. So you may know it better, may have come across it as Kadaka in Hungary and Kadaka with a C in Romania, um, where it is kind of coming back to, to fame a bit more, probably came from around Lake Skadar in what's Montenegro today originally, but there's also a relationship with a Turkish grape. So, you know, let, let's call it local to, to, to the Balkans. Um, but Bulgaria grows far more of it than anybody else. So it's kind of a really important signature grape, especially for Northern Bulgaria. Um, and this is old vineyards, so 50 year old vineyards plus, uh, no, we're still on Gamza. So, um, and it's just, again, very low intervention, hand-picked crates, um, relatively short fermentation, cool, but not super cold, um, and no sulfites at all. And it's unfiltered. And I think those old vines make a huge difference. For anybody that's familiar with Kadaka, you know, I was looking at some Kadaka from Hungary earlier today, and it's almost like a light rosé. So if I stop sharing this, hopefully I can show you that. Um, okay, so that's the, the bottle. And I will try to show you the color of the wine. Now this is a really, for Kadaka, this is quite a deep red color. Um, and I think it's that intensity that you're getting from these super old vines and the really naturally very low yields. And, you know, you've just got this, you know, joyful, I love Gamza, Kadaka, whatever you want to call it. Um, I think it gives joyful wines, you know, in the sort of mold of the direction of Pinot Noir, because it's the acidity um, that forms the structure. It's not a tannic grape variety. Um, so it's getting that fruit acid balance that's 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 um, really important. And especially if you're going to go natural and not add any sulfites as well, that acid balance is absolutely critical. And just to tell you, it's 12 and a half percent. So obviously it's been picked relatively early to keep that freshness as well to it. Mm. So Adriana, if you're here, would you like to say a few words about your your wine? I know she was the going to... for what I know, she she may have had problems tuning in for some yeah. reason or another. So I don't think we may yeah. have her present with us. Okay. Well, oh, sorry, she... sorry. Actually, sorry. I could see her her profile here if mm. she's on. Mm. Adriana. I'm not sure that I'm uh, online. It's uh, so difficult to to join. To, we to can hear you. you. We we hear you, Adriana. Mm -hmm. Hi, thank you. <laughs> Hi. Hi. If you want a quick couple of words on the wine, uh, maybe from you. Yeah, we see you as well. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, first, uh, thank you very much to join me with uh, so beautiful wine in Bulgaria, Gamza a variety. Gamza was the reason to be here with Ogi many, many years ago. And um, when I saw the vineyards, uh, I saw the great um, uh, Dape River and different soils there, it was uh, a big chance for us uh, because uh, I, we dream about the soil with sandy soil, um, different style. That's why we decided to um, vinificate different type Gamza. You, you, you can see big difference be between Gamza Borovica or Gamza Black Pack, Gamza Granny. There are several hears, uh, um, hills there and they are very difficult, different each other. Um, I saw the very, very old vineyards. They are more 60 years old. It's very, very interesting for us because uh, they're like tree and uh, it was inspired us to decided to make some 
very deep wine, very beautiful and concentrate. Mm. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I mean that the, the wines that from from Borovitsa really are very individual and you know real single vineyard wines, real terroir wines, I suppose. And, and again, that was a pioneering move, I think, from, from Oggi and Adriana was to start to emphasize terroir um, in very specific places in their wines, very specific vineyards, old vines where they could find them and that sort of thing, which um, again, more and more people are starting to understand terroir and to really focus on what different vineyards and different soils can give in Bulgaria. But I would say, um, you know, Adriana and Oggi were some of the first people that I, I saw doing that um, um, back in the day. So, uh, yeah. I think we, are we, we still got you there, Adriana? Um, yeah. Yeah, I think so. Hmm. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for sharing. We do have that. a quick question yeah. on the gums i believe which i'll read quickly yeah. and that yeah. is uh, what are the yields for those old vines gums if maybe adriana knows i guess best yeah yields sorry, sorry i didn't hear how many uh, um oh I've, I've got it here five to six hundred kilos per decar so that's five to six tons to the hectare according to the your product uh -huh. sheet is that right yeah. adriana yeah, 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 yeah. Not more. Mm -hmm. Which is actually pretty low yielding for Gamza because with those, it has quite big berries and can, can yield quite generously, which was one of the reasons why it was popular in the past. <laughs> mm. Okay, awesome. Then if there are no more questions on that, thank you, Adriana. And we'll just, um, come on. Um, um, I'm going to take you now down to the opposite end of the country, down in the southwest corner, another amazingly dramatic place. You have to go to Bulgaria and explore its environment. You know, there's so much to see. So the Melnik Sand Pyramids and the little town of Melnik with its little red roofed houses in the in the valley down here. So I I stayed here couple of years ago and, and went for a run as I tend to do and got to the top of the hill and sort of looked out and went my god this scenery is just amazing and this was you know dawn light coming up onto these sand pyramids it's a very dramatic place Melnick itself is very beautiful and very quaint and you can go and see some churches and you can go and see a historic merchant's house and you can go and meet some fantastic wineries and it's a region where there are actually quite a few sort of like-minded wine producers so they're kind of probably the most organized region in many ways of Bulgaria because a group of like-minded family producers similar sort of size 10 to 30 hectares sort of thing um, mostly returned from other businesses, but have a family connection, usually to the grandparents. So Nikolai, who's the winery owner, remembers going and helping his grandfather tend the Sandansky misket and, and his grandparents treating it as a bit of medicine. So, um, and his parents came have a, a meat business, but he and um, his family have taken over running the winery. Um, a small winery in this very beautiful area and this is their winemaker Desi who um, has taken the chance to travel. She uh, two hands wine, winery in Australia she says was a great inspiration for her so hence I picked a picture of her at two hands but she was really energized by you know the the openness of people there and and the willingness to travel and to share and so on and, and then has brought that back to Bulgaria where she's being very creative and I know she wanted to talk to me about um, she's not only sort of working with the native grape varieties like Melnik 55 as we have here but she's also doing some work with sort of pet nat styles and orange styles and and so on as well which I'm sure she'd be very happy to talk more about but say so this is a winery 
it's a region that where the native grape varieties are very important. Um, one of them being this Melnick 55. I should show you the label as well because it's uh, sort of very pretty and based on a. Um, uh, let's stop the share. And then you can see the label that's based on a sort of Bulgarian tapestry design. So no, Broadleaf Melnick is one of the parents of Melnick 55. And Broadleaf Melnick has a bit of a problem in being a right sod to get ripe. Um, and some people have even given up trying to make red wines out of Broadleaf Melnick at all. Um, there are people making great sparkling out of it and, and so on. Um, but Melnick 55 was a cross cross created in the previous era, um, first vinified in 1977, and it was a cross made from broadleaf Melnick and some mixed pollen. And it turns out that a grape called Valdigue is the other parent. So, and it ripens usefully about two or so weeks earlier than Mel, uh, broadleaf Melnick. Um, it keeps cut some of broadleaf Melnick's um, characters. Um, a sort of, you know, a bit Nebbiolo-like can be quite scented, tar and roses kind of character to it. But it also has a bit more roundness and flesh and a bit more sort of black blackberry fruit as well. And one of the things I liked about this wine is actually that it's it's there's no oak here at all, you know, so you're just focusing on the purity of the fruit and really experiencing what the um, what the grape variety can give. Um, so I say it is just, so it's from their own vineyards, 15 year old vines, um, controlled stainless steel fermentation and say no oak at all, just so you can experience the purity of what, uh, what Melnick 55 can give. So Desi, if you're here, do you want to say a few words about your wine, uh, the wine and your experience of working um, in Bulgaria? <laughs> Is she here? Okay, silence. Maybe she's not here. I believe she is, but she needs to press her unmute button. Ah, okay, there we go. She is here, yes. No, still muted. Can you hear me now? Yes, awesome. <laughs> uh, thank you. Oh. For for uh, for this thing because we need this support <laughs> mm. and um, uh, this uh, I work with this variety since 2016 and we oh you're freezing no I think we've lost you uh, <laughs> do you hear me okay and. I want to say that I'm very happy because uh, when I start uh, working with Melnik 55 was a big challenge because I changed the direction. Uh, for me was uh, new terroir, for me was new winery, new varieties. But I know that I want to make a modern wine uh, to, uh, to open the potential and uh, to say to um, to to show the potential of the of the of this variety, and um, the thing is that uh, this uh, vintage was really uh, really hard in general uh, because um, I it's uh, my opinion, but um, was really hard because uh, there is a lot of rains during the flowering uh, during the spring which is not good and another thing uh, that uh, the wind uh, the summer was extremely hot extremely hot and the grape was uh, quite stressed and actually um uh, we've lost you again for this uh for this wine and I'm so happy because uh, it was uh, difficult for us in the winery, but uh, the Melnik, this Melnik is with, uh, uh, if you can see, silver medal in the decanter, and we are very proud with. <laughs> and uh, yes, uh, uh, I 
Okay, I think we've lost you again, Desi. <laughs> okay. Um, well, so thank you, Desi. I'm sorry, the signal's kind of coming and going. So maybe if you wanted to add anything, maybe you could type it. <laughs> um, but yes, um, yeah. And I'm just one of the things I'm, I hope I've just shown you a little bit of a snapshot really of how dynamic Bulgaria is, um, how varied the styles of the wine, the winemaking approaches are, um, and how much there is to really explore. Um, so actually, Desi, we've got a question about modern way of winemaking. Can you um, expand on that? Uh, actually, uh, the, the thing is that last few years we, uh, we try to, um, to, to make uh, the, the process normally. Um, uh, the thing is that uh, um, um, we, uh, we don't using so many, uh, so many uh, products during the winemaking. We are not using enzymes, tannins, and we know the process and the chemistry and micro microbiology of the process. And, uh, we just uh, uh, give them a chance to 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 uh, how to say to go ahead in Bulgarian this if you want and I'll translate but then we keep losing her. There is a question of how old the vines are, but I believe we touched on that sort of 15 year old. 15 year old is what we do, but they're 17 years old. It's a vine near to Livunovo. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the soils are sandy warm, uh, the warmer soils. And uh, about winemaking, um, actually, uh, last two vintages, we make. Uh, a cold maceration, post-fermentive maceration, but for this wine, uh, we directly ferment uh, the, the grape. Mm. So this wasn't cold macerated, but the next vintage is, if I've understood correctly, if you can hear me. Yes. We are not, how, how I say, the, uh, we don't use enzymes and tannins and we, um, we uh, know the process and just allow everything. The, the commercial enzymes, they're actually in, in the grape. And mm -hmm. if you allow uh, and make a condition, this, all this process uh, to flow normally and uh, uh, no, and this is the, the secret of our uh, wine. Yeah, so I think I'm hearing this story more that people are now confident to let the vineyard and the quality of the grapes show in the winemaking. Little question, do you use any whole bunch um, fermentation at all? In, in this vintage, no, but uh, 2019, we use 20% uh, whole bunch. Oh, okay, it'll be interesting to see how that Actually, evolves then with the new label and uh, um, uh, in uh, the technology we have 20% whole bunch. Okay, I shall look forward to trying that then. Um, and I think there's no um, oak maturation in that wine. Somebody was asking about the oak oh, or the maturation regime. Um, and I don't think you have any irrigation? Uh, we uh, actually I said that this this summer was extremely hot mm -hmm. and um, there is not so much rain and um, it, it, it was difficult because uh, uh, the sugars uh, start uh, to increasing but it's not ripening. The normal process is sugar goes up and the acidity goes uh, down. This vintage was awful because uh, uh, the sugar level goes uh, uh, increasing. The, the... Hmm. No, we've lost you again. Um, 
yeah and I think uh, because it's 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 not uh, the normal ripening uh, that's why you need to irrigate mm. yeah okay we um, irrigate yes we irrigate it depends from the uh, from the vintage and from the summer last two vintages was really really good mm -hmm. because uh, um because uh, summer wasn't so uh, so hot and there is a few rains and I think that uh, wasn't so so stressful for for the grape and for the winemakers. Yeah. <laughs> this is a, a quick Actually, question from up. Carol from Lady of the Grapes. Would you say you're doing a kind of organic or natural winemaking? With not much added. We try to, we try, uh, uh, but I, I don't uh, make a spontaneous, spontaneous fermentation. But uh, um, I try to to make organic. But we use uh, yeast that are um, bio certificates, and uh, we try to do. Um, the wines with uh, not so many uh, magic powders, how many people. <laughs> we, we want uh, fruit uh, to show uh, his power. <laughs> okay, awesome. Great. Thank you so much. Well, let's thank you to all the winemakers. There's also Katia Gargova is, I think, here. And some of the winemakers, the younger winemakers mentioned her as an inspiration. So I don't know if you wanted to have a few words about how you've seen the progress of the women winemakers in, in Bulgarian wine, Katia. And if not, we can open the floor to some questions and comments, um, you know, the Bulgarians might have some views as to some of the things I've said. And um, yeah, so the floor is open, I think, then. If, uh, hello. Oh, hello, Katia. Katia, uh, right. okay. <laughs> I didn't expect it to <laughs> ask me to say okay. something. You don't uh, want to if you don't want to, but I, obviously you were helpful. I'm and, happy. <laughs> I'm happy to be a part of this meeting and uh, to see all this uh, presentation and, and uh, nice uh, Bulgarian winemakers. <laughs> uh, I think, um, what was the question actually? Um, I want just to say that uh, The Bulgarian uh, winemaking uh, goes uh, ahead. Um, many uh, women are in the winemaking and um, I'm happy to, to see all this, uh, those, uh, and uh, also Adriana, which I know from my first uh, steps in winemaking, and then to see Maria, uh, Desi, uh, all, all these winemakers, uh, Madeleine, and uh, I'm not ready to say something, just, uh, Thank you for all, all these organizations. And, uh, okay. Well, thank you. Good for luck for, for Bulgarian <laughs> wines. So thank you, Katia. I mean, the main point that I wanted to make tonight really was about how dynamic Bulgarian wine is, but also to shout about the fact that Bulgaria, you know, has got something unique going on here with having so many great winemakers who are women as well and that equality that is missing in quite a lot of the wine world you know we're still having to fight our corners a lot um, 
you know, a lot of women are still having to fight their corners against sexism, against um, lack of equality and lack of opportunity. So I think, you know, if, if we can use this two ways to show that Bulgaria is making great and dynamic and interesting and exciting wine. And, you know, there's some great people behind these wines. And there's also a great story here at the, you know, that so many of these great wines are being made by women as well, who are great winemakers who happen to be women. As I say, I said at the beginning, I don't want to single you out for being women winemakers because that's patronizing. Like I don't want to be singled out as a woman wine writer either. Um, so, so if this is something we can kind of support each other to put Bulgaria on the world wine map and support you know all these great winemakers as well I think um, I think I hope you'll agree with me that that would be a very good thing so you know I think we've had some lovely wines those of you that didn't have the wines I think you've missed out um, but they're available from the guys at the old cellar um, I can also I mean some of you will know that I also wrote a book on the, on some of the things we've talked about today um, if you want to know some more about background on Bulgaria and I would just so encourage you to go and see the place for yourselves and meet some of these great people and taste the wines in in, in situ as well so and yeah if anybody wanted to um, you know add anything or tell me I'm wrong about some of the things I've picked up from you all then you know floor is open but thank you everybody for attending and we're here all of us the winemakers me um, for any questions or discussion thank you i have a question for tanya mm. yeah david street i visited you in june 2018 with a group from worcestershire yeah i remember i remember oh, hi good. nice to meet you <laughs> meet again you. Yeah. uh 2018 it was um you were in some very old um, corrugated iron sheds and you wanted to redevelop and get some new buildings. Have you been successful yet? Not yet, because we're still focused in the uh, vineyards and uh, in investing there and also in the winery uh, in terms of technology and barrels and uh, tanks. Uh, so it's still just a dream, unfortunately. But as I like to say, uh, being one of the most ugliest wineries in Bulgaria's exterior, I, I think we produce was one of the most interesting and uh, fascinating wines. And um, as we say, we like to say that's uh, what Maria uh, uh, made a, some kind of our own expression for our wines. We make wines with a character are. So uh, they combine character of the owners and the winemaker and the terror of, uh, of Sakar. Uh, but um, what changed during that time, that is, uh, we have uh, now a very, in the region, very close to our winery, a new beautiful winery with a hotel and a restaurant. It's called Zara Estate. And just a few 200 meters from our winery, another small new winery with a very nice tasting room and a restaurant. So next time you come to Bulgaria, uh, you have a much uh, more pleasant experience in the region in terms of uh, food uh, and uh, accommodation. And so the, the picture is almost full. No. Thank you. I look forward to that. <laughs> Hope to see you soon. <laughs> a quick question, everybody. I mean, there are a few at the moment. Uh, probably one that I'll attend quickly is uh, an opinion that it is a pity that the reputation of the Bulgarian wines in the UK is still not recognized as top class wines. How would you? change that attitude for sure uh, bulgaria is with most people known uh, yet as a country with a reputation going years back and we are still to revive to sort of restart to of course to gain more recognition in definitely amongst the younger generation and that because none of them 
would consider Bulgaria as a significant winemaking country. It is not an overnight process, as we know. Of course, the market is uh, definitely competitive uh, and sort of challenging at all times. Uh, we do, of course, with the help of the winemakers and the present uh, sort of, I can call it, renaissance of the Bulgarian winemaking as a whole, we have the support and the sort of things to step on and build that reputation. Of course, it is a matter of heavy uh, focus on marketing, which is quite a downside in terms of missing, a, 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 so let's say, a major brand as Wines of Bulgaria at present. Uh, a few of us, of course, uh, importers in various countries, UK and many others, as well as quite a few uh, of our colleagues back in Bulgaria, are joining forces at present and over the past couple of years to, to go ahead and build such a brand. Uh, of course, like I, I did say, it's not it's more of a mid to long term project. Uh, and yeah, sort of gaining recognizability or showing the wines on a small scale, on a slightly bigger scale, and uh, definitely keeping this consistency going forward is quite the key. To me, again, stepping on the quality of the wines, on the interesting uh, sort of elements uh, about them, and of course, involving the history, and mostly the, again, the, the sort of brighter future to mention of Bulgarian wine is, uh, again, something to be communicated at all times, definitely to the, to the wine trade people, to the journalists, uh, to the, again, to the wine lovers as a whole, all together. And uh, we up to up for the challenge. I mean, ourselves, definitely with the help of uh, great uh, wine professionals like uh, Caroline Gilby. Uh, and uh, we believe and we're optimistic that the future for Bulgarian wine is bright in that regard. Mm. But we have to tell people, and you know, this is a private initiative really with the old seller guys, you know, there's, there is a lack of a generic, generic body that has any money to do anything you know um i've been trying to organize a, a trip to um a corner of bulgaria for the circle of wine writers for instance but that was going to and then covid got in the way but again that was going to be funded by a group of wineries rather than but there being any kind of generic support to get the word out there so it is very much all about private initiatives really at the moment as far as certainly as far as this market's concerned um and there's only so much we 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 small band of people can do you know we've been doing our modern wines of bulgaria tastings for a couple of years now and hopefully we'll we'll do another one in the not too distant future but yeah but i think there's a great story here there's so much i want to tell people about what's happened in bulgaria and what is continuing to happen you know such an exciting place it's a beautiful place there are great people great stories and great wines what more do you want in a wine country I mean, okay, so not everything's right. Absolutely not everything's right. But, you know, let's let's celebrate the positives and the progress that's happening. Okay, well, if nobody... Oh, can I, oh, can I ask yeah. a question? Yeah, of course. <laughs> okay, fabulous. Sorry, everyone's like, I want to go home now. No, you can't. <laughs> um, first of all, just to all the wineries, all the wines are fantastic. I'm not surprised I did the last tasting and all these indigenous grape varieties were, were fabulous. All the fruit, the cleanness, the freshness, I all of them are fantastic. And the price point is awesome. So I do think in the UK, we're gonna have a, um, if, if, if this gets out there, people will actually really embrace it. People just need to know about it. I personally, not that the whites were better than the reds, but I just love the aromatics of the whites. I thought they're actually quite unique um very special so i thought that was really really interesting um and great presentation caroline so thank you i just just a, a quick question i think the last um presentation i was here we discussed that mavrud and rubin in terms of the red grape varieties were probably the signatures potentially carrying bulgaria forward we'll see we've obviously tasted two whites now i think before white it was kaleshki miska and another k name karasuda karasuda yeah, we can. Yeah. What yeah. what do we think is the white grape varieties that are the signature that will move mm. area forward? Yeah, I struggle a little bit with that because um, most of Bulgaria's indigenous grape, white grapes are either not very interesting. Dimiat, for instance, needs quite a lot of work to make it interesting. Now, again, people are working on it, but fundamentally, it's not a 
that exciting as a grape variety. And then quite a lot of the, the various miscets are quite aromatic. And that means that they're never going to give you that, I suppose, the breadth of opportunities with the winemaking because they tend to need to be drunk young when they're fresh and pretty and aromatic. You can't do stuff with barrels really or too much skin contact or whatever. So, um, so I'm actually not sure what the signature <laughs> grape variety is yet. I'm still waiting to be convinced on that one. So maybe the locals would like to give some views on that point of, from that perspective. <laughs> Thank you. Mm. Uh, that that was a very interesting question. Um, so I could, uh, of course, I can speak mostly um, uh, from my point of view and point of view uh, uh, and the, the the terror of our region, which is very specific. Uh, though with Melnik we have very similar uh, climate characteristics in terms of sunshine, temperatures, etc. River influence, uh, Mediterranean influence, but the soils are very different. So uh, uh, Sakhar is a very specific region and our observations of all winemakers in our region um, show that uh, there is a big potential in two international varieties like Chardonnay and Viognier that are very terroir adaptive. So they can grow in the northern parts, more cool climate and, on, and also uh, have really exciting results in warmer climates like ours. And uh, the, the interesting addition here is exactly Tamianka. So there, there are a couple of wineries already in the region making a blend of Chardonnay, Viognier and Tamianka. And for the first year this Vintage, oh, this in a couple of months, probably, we will release our first plant uh, aged in oak, mm -hmm. Chardonnay, Viognier, Tamianca. We will never put Tamianca aged in barrel in its dry style, though we have uh, sweet Tamianca in aged in four, for four years in, in barrel, but it's completely different style of wine. Um, uh, but this could be of a signature blend for our region, Chardonnay, Viognier, Tamianca, because you have the, the body and the structure from the Chardonnay and then added aromas from the Viognier and Tamianca. Uh, so look forward, this type of blend coming from Sakar, not only from our winery, but as you said, Caroline Dimiat, it mm -hmm. worked properly with, and Katja Gargova could say more about it, uh, it's also an interesting, for me personally, variety from the whites. Yeah. Okay. Um, somebody asked common wine style from female winemakers, Vonko. Um, I think that. I would certainly say I think that Bulgarian wine has evolved over the last few years to become a bit more elegant and a bit more subtle and have a bit more finesse and a bit more sense of place about it rather than just being how big a wine can we make and I suspect that some of the women winemakers have had a hand in that. <laughs> uh, Thank you. <laughs> Yeah. Um, any other questions I've missed? I'm sure there was one. I was Nikolai asked about Bulgarian wine imported. Um, there's a reasonable volume. I mean, it's nowhere near its peak. It's probably about 10 percent of the volume that was imported in the mid 1990s. Um, it is increasing a little bit, but most Bulgarian wine in the UK is still kind of bottom shelf of the supermarket, Merlot and Cabernet. There's still quite a bit of that around if you actually look. Um, and you have to go to specialists like the old seller and a couple of other people really for some of the more um, um, interesting premium wines that, um, I think still have a lot of, you know, they're not cheap, cheap, like the bottom shelf stuff, but I think you get a lot of wine for what you pay. So from that point of view, um, I think they can offer a lot of value for money. 
Okay, if there are any other questions, can't see anybody. Um, otherwise then, thank you so much for your attention, everybody that's come and joined us. And if I missed a question, you know, obviously feel free to message me or the guys at the old cellar. Um, if there's anything else you want to know. And um, yeah, thanks so much for coming and listening to what I and the winemakers have to say about the scene in Bulgaria. So much appreciated. And obviously, I wrote a book about it. <laughs> but yeah, cheers to the old seller for supporting this event, particularly as well. So um, yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you, Caroline. And thank you from the old seller's behalf to everybody that tuned in. And to keep drinking Bulgarian wine, guys. Mm -hmm. Yeah, na Na zdrave. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs>